الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon the masterpiece Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household and all his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may he bless every single one of us. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, as you know, the second taraweeh has just been read and we have entered into the second day of Ramadan. And before we know it, believe me, the entire month will have come to an end. Every year the Ramadan passes quicker than the previous year. And that is the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So just hold in, don't be lazy. Because shaitan comes to us and he tends to whisper in our ears and we become lazy after that. So after we have had a good start, we tend to become more slack. And after that, we regret at the end of the month thinking to ourselves, why didn't we do this and do that? It was only but a month. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us. As promised yesterday, we look at the darkness surrounding the Arabian Peninsula just before the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, the darkness that the whole globe was upon. If you take a look at in India, how a woman was treated, she was such that if her husband died, there was no chance of marrying again. Most of them burnt themselves to death because they were taught that. They were brainwashed to believe that that was their system. And they believed in reincarnation. When a person dies, up to today, there are some who believe that the person reappears in the form of some either bird or snake, depending on whether they led a good life or a bad one. I remember one of the sisters once in my own community telling me, that they had some people visiting them after the death of one of the relatives. And as they walked out, they saw a dove sitting on one of the branches of a tree. And they looked at this dove and they said, Oh, that must be this person. And when I was told, I thought to myself, Well, this dove was alive well before the death of this person. But look at how the people's minds are. The darkness at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or just prior to his time, if you take a look at the Arabian Peninsula, religiously, as we mentioned yesterday, they worshipped idols. So much so that they made idols out of stones. And when they found a better stone, they would throw away what they used to worship for so many years. And when they had a big problem, they would go to someone who had a bigger stone to say, hang on, can I borrow your God because I've got an issue, big problem. Allahu Akbar. Imagine the brains of the people. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he actually says, as intelligent as he was, he says, we made a God out of dates. And you know, we could shape it up much more easily than stone. So we shaped it up and it was so nice. And one day I was very hungry, asking the God for food, food, no food came, I ate the God. Allahu Akbar, ate the, the God. So this was the type of mentality around the darkness. They believed in lots of superstition, as we mentioned last night. See something and they believed, oh, this means that will happen. And that means this will happen. And if this happens, then this. If you see a cinnamon, then that. If someone is having hiccups, then another person is remembering them. If you sneeze once, that means someone has remembered you and so on. This had all come from that particular time. And it seeped through across the globe. For your information, to this day, some of us are guilty of believing in some of these superstitious items. So thereafter, if you look at one of their habits, they visited the fortune tellers. Anything happened, they went to the fortune teller and they let him solve their matter. And these fortune tellers, they were powerful in the sense that they knew how to study the lives of people. And they had contact with the spirits. As I mentioned yesterday, contact with the spirits, contact with the jinn is not impossible, but it is prohibited. 
We are not allowed to deal in that and we are not allowed to go into that, although we would know how it operates and how to protect ourselves from it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to recite the verses of the Quran that are relevant. We recited them this evening, Ayatul Kursi, as well as the last few verses of Surah Baqarah, the most powerful of them. And the last two surahs of the Quran, these are powerful surahs which should be read every morning and evening with the intention of dua and protection. And then you find one of the habits they had, they did not believe in the life after death. They would say, Who is going to give life to these bones after they are uh, decomposed completely and like dust they become? And Allah says, Say, he will give those bones life who gave them the life in the first place. So for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create man in the first place, to resurrect him is even easier. If you have no BMW and you were to make one, you are far more a genius than a person who has just panel beaten a damaged BMW. Simple logic. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. Obviously, walillahi al-mathal al-a'la. Allah has a far higher example than that which we just gave. But this was only to bring it closer to our brains and minds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of how when they were in difficulty, they left their gods. They called out to the one deity who created them. Whoever made me, I'm calling out to him. That was when? When they had a problem. When they had difficulties. So like Allah says, فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ إِذَا هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ When they were on the ship, and when the boat rocks a little bit, you know when you're at sea, they would call out to Allah alone. And as soon as they come back, what would happen? they would immediately start engaging in their polytheism once again, worshipping the other false deities besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the politics, at that particular time, people were divided into two major groups. You find the people of the Badiyah, the people of the desert, and the people of the cities. And up to today, you find those, mashallah, who are living in smaller towns have far greater hearts. They have far better qualities than those who are in the city who don't even have time to greet you. They don't even have time to be hospitable. Whereas the slow life of those who are further away, mashallah, one of the secrets why we are here in Polokwani, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and make our hearts pure at all times. Wallahi, it's a point of goodness. I feel really that this is about to be, if not, it has already started as one of the best Ramadans. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those who lose out. Believe me, as I say always, it's like a train that is passing. You catch it, you catch it. You missed it, everybody else caught it. You're alone in the station. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us miss our trains and planes. I'm sure you know how it feels. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So they had people in the cities and people out in the deserts, in the rural areas, so to speak. But they had something in common, very strong lineage. They were divided into tribes, families, and they literally stood up for one another. They would fight the other tribe because of a problem that it had had with one particular person. One camel goes missing, for example, and they doubted those people or someone was caught. The war lasted 40 years, 40 years. People died. The next generation did not even know why they were fighting, but they continued fighting. This was the type of Kabbaliyah they had. They had this tribalism and they had stuck to their clans. Sometimes it was used for the good and sometimes it was used for the bad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them by sending them the message. But if we take a look at the leadership of these clans was always with a certain type of person and family. And usually it fell from father to child or to brother and so on. And this was the way they led. So the leader, the chief, and when he died, his son took over or a relative took over. But there was something that could raise a person from nothing. What was that? If someone's level was very low, they just had to come up with some poetry, which was so powerful linguistically and full of meaning 
that it would instantly raise the rank of that individual sometimes to the point of leadership. Subhanallah. Why? They were crazy about eloquence. So crazy. They were the most powerful people when it came to speech. In fact, they were unlettered. The bulk of them, almost 100% of them could not read or write. But linguistically, they were powerful. They hardly used slang. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we will see later on, as he grew up, he never used slang. He was always the most powerful. It is reported that he never ever made a linguistic error in his life. Subhanallah. Nothing. That was his gift by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why later on we see how they looked at him and they listened to him and they were mesmerized by what he said. Subhanallah, completely shocked. So much so that later on the Arabic language began to take its rules and correct itself through the Quran. Because that was what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. Up to this day, the Kuffar, the Christian Arabs, and those who are non-Muslims from amongst the Arabs, they still use the Quran when it comes to linguistics in order to correct their language and to explain to you what is right and wrong. Subhanallah. So if you take a look at them from the angle of their wealth, and if you look at them economically, what did they have? They did not have much in terms of produce because it barely rained. And if it did, it was all desert. But in certain spots, they had had the date palm that used to grow a lot. And they had a few other things that would grow, but very, very little. A lot of their trading happened to be with the livestock that they had had. They had a lot of car, sorry, they had a lot of camels, donkeys, as well as goats and sheep. Subhanallah. The donkeys, obviously, they wouldn't really count them as part of livestock as non-edible. But at the same time, you look at the amount of goats and sheep they had had, subhanallah. And there was a difference between those who had had camels and those who had had goats and sheep. Those who had had camels up to today, those who have camels, they have their noses high up in the air. We have camels. And you know, it's considered very expensive and considered something so wealthy. Like today, you have someone driving the latest motor vehicle. There, it was known as Humur in Naam. The red camel, it was something amazing. It had value more than the BMWs today. I don't know what is making me repeat it, although I don't like the vehicle myself. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness, a vehicle that will serve its purpose, rather than a vehicle that will bring about arrogance, bearing in mind that if you have the wealth, you are allowed to buy the highest and the best of all the vehicles you want, on condition that it does not make you arrogant. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So if we look at them, this is what they had. Those who had had camels were much more proud in terms of the wrong pride than those who had had goats and sheep who were much more down to earth and humble. So much so, subhanallah, Allah has kept it such that every Nabi, every prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he started from a very early age looking after goats and sheep. Never was it mentioned that they were looking after camels. It was always goat and sheep. Al-Ghanam, Ra'i al-Ghanam. Ma min nabiyin illa wa ra'a al-Ghanam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says there was no prophet except that he started off by looking after sheep. We will get to that inshallah a little bit later. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them a gift by sending them Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to remove them from the darkness of arrogance and to make them spend in the cause and in the good cause. Then another thing they had had when it came to their economic life. If you take a look at the caravans, they had lots of caravans that would travel towards the north when it came to the summer and towards the south when it came to the winter because the winters up north were too cold for them to handle. So they used to go down towards the south, towards Yemen. And this is why the Quran speaks about these journeys. Allah is speaking of the gift of the taming of Quraysh during both of their journeys, that which happened in winter and that which happened in summer. In winter, as I said, they went south and in summer they went up towards the north. Why does Allah make mention of the taming of Quraysh? Because the caravans were waylaid almost all the time. 
There were hijackers and highwaymen who came and who would steal and there were wars and people used to have to have weapons with them in order to fight those who want to come and steal and usurp. A lot of their economics was based on how powerful they were. The wars that took place, they would usurp and come back. If, if there were some weak tribes, they always joined some strong tribes and signed treaties with them so that they could look after the smaller ones. Because the bigger tribes, sometimes they just went in, usurped and came out. Today it happens to us. You find someone who's strong and powerful, he eats the money of the weak. Allahu Akbar. And the weak sometimes can do nothing unless you know someone. When you know someone, they can fix whoever is trying to fix you. That's what has happened today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us fall prey to that. We need to know no matter how powerful we think we are, Allah is more powerful than us. So Allah says, Quraysh was given a gift. They used to travel north and south so calm without anyone ever harming them. That was a sign of Allah to say Quraysh is a chosen clan. They used to travel north and south. And Allah says, Allah is making mention of their taming, the, the fact that they could go with all peace without worry of what would happen to our caravans. Nobody touched their caravans. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us such that our wealth, which we've earned in a halal manner, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect it for us, preserve it for us, make it sustenance of mercy, sustenance of goodness, and not sustenance that brings about or brings with it lots of destruction and arrogance. Amen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them that gift of the peace and the calm. But they had mixed with the Jews. They had dealings with some Jewish people who taught them how to charge interest. And this is why in the people of Quraysh, they began to charge interest. And the Arabs at large, they charged interest. Why was it wrong? Well, at that time it was right because to them it was right. Although Islam, when Islam came, Islam protected the poor by banning interest because the interest factor makes the rich richer and keeps the poor even poorer. When you borrow, what happens to you? Allahu Akbar. May Allah safeguard us and not enslave us. And when you lend, what happens to you? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us having big hearts. May He make us from those who can assist one another rather than those who are milking one another even though they're not allowed to drink that milk. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So they had a lot of interest. Also they had festivals. Some known as Ukal and Mijannah and Dhul Majaz. These were some of the festivals that the Arabs had had after the month of Shawwal or in the month of Shawwal, Dhul Qa'dah and Dhul Hijjah in such a way that they used to then gather in Arafah and they used to not deal with anything at all. They used to fulfill Hajj. But what type of Hajj? It came down from Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. But they mixed it in such a way that they began to worship idols during those days. And they worshipped idols through the morning and the evenings. And they would then remember Allah as well. Allahu Akbar at times. As I told you, times of need. We do it as well. We sin sometimes every day. And then when we have a big problem, we raise our hands as though we are the most deserving of the mercy of Allah. But where were you? Where were you all this time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, had favored you. And when you were in goodness, then you turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that you are in difficulty, you want to turn to Allah. Still, Allah gives us. But the winner is the one who is mentioned in the hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us ta'arraf ilallahi fi rakhai ya'rifka fi shidda. Get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at times of ease. And Allah will get close to you at times of your difficulty. So these people, they used to have their Hajj, they used to have their festivals during specific times. And if you look at now, the social life that was prevalent at the time of Quraysh, just prior to the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and round about that time, you would find they were very proud of their lineage and status. I am the son of so and so. Do you know who I am? I am this and I am that. Based on their father, Allahu Akbar. Today what happens, you find father works so hard, so hard. And the son is the laziest person in the world. And he says, my daddy got a shop, man. I'm all right. I'm safe. I'm okay. I don't know if you've heard that. Daddy got a shop. MashaAllah. Your father's got a shop, a business. Alhamdulillah. He sweated day in, day out in order to build it. You, a few actions, you can actually bring it to the ground just because you have haram habits. 
What does that mean? When a person is involved in haram, whether it is womanizing, drinking, gambling, any other bad habit, pornography, whatever else it is, believe me, your sustenance crashes and the barakah in your wealth actually goes away. Yet, if you had to calculate how much Allah put into your direction, it would be so much, perhaps in its millions. But where did it all go? Well, you've got haram habits. That's where it all went. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Inna rajula la yuhramu rizqu yusibuhu. A man is blocked from sustenance because of the sins he commits sometimes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. You can never achieve sustenance through the displeasure of the owner of sustenance. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. So these were people also who, as I said, they were very, very eloquent. They used to love listening to poetry. They used to love listening to eloquence. If a man came up with a statement that was full in meaning, wallahi, they listened to it. And they got so excited that they raised that man's ranks. They actually gave him sometimes wealth and they made him wealthy from amongst them just because he could talk and he had a tongue. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Then there was a very big issue. Now, if you notice, some of these habits of theirs were good and some of them were bad. Speaking of one of the worst habits, the treatment of the women. Women were treated as commodities and nikah or marriage was something very, very absurd at that time. People used to marry. One category of people used to marry correctly, where someone wants to marry, they go and speak to the, the guardians of the female and they arrange it and the nikah is done. That remained even after Islam. But sometimes they used to marry in a very strange way. A man owed another man money, so he would take his wife along, his women along, and he would say, right, you can have these, you can impregnate my wife, and when she is pregnant, you send her back to me, that child will hold your name. A'udhu Billah. Imagine what type of ignorance. Today on the globe, they have something known as swinging, where people swap their wives. It happens even in the midst of some ignorant Muslims. They swap their wives for a weekend in order to have fun. That is exactly the jahiliyyah of the pre-Islamic era. May Allah never return us to that. It happened to them, it's repeating itself with us, but in a different way. And people are conning the women folk. And you know what? This is interesting. Wallahi, you get nowhere. Nowhere do you get with that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us by removing us from this darkness. Another way of marriage was a woman who needed a bit of wealth would put a flag up by her home. And people would come to her literally as though she was a prostitute. And each one would do whatever he would like and thereafter pay her a bit. And if she was expecting, she chose one of them. And she said, it's your child. And nobody could say no. So the child would be called after the man there. And she would choose the most honored so that the child could be brought up under the guardianship of some strange man. A'udhu Billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. And they had a fourth type of marriage as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Mentioning some of these things is actually irrelevant. But the only reason why I repeat this is today, we are returning to some of these habits with different names. And we are returning to the jahiliyyah and the ignorance that was pre-Islam, the darkness. It is called the darkest of darkness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us out of that. And then if you look at the divorce of a woman, oh, the men would just come and say, okay, I divorce you, you're divorced. And next thing they say, no, I take you back, I divorce you, take you back. And the woman, nobody would say anything because they were so embarrassed to even bear female children that whenever there was a female child, they used to take, they were very upset. Their faces became blackened. يَتَوَارَى مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ Whenever any one of them was informed of a female child, their faces would be blackened and they would become angry. They would want to hide behind the walls because of the bad news that they had just received. And they would take the child. One of the Sahaba, رضي الله عنهم, he says, in my period of ignorance, I buried my daughter. She was so beautiful, such that she was saying, Daddy, what are you doing? What are you doing? And she began to wipe off the little sand that was on my beard. And as she's doing that, I kept on putting more and more sand on her until she realized what was happening and she began to kick. And then I covered her completely and let her die. A'udhu Billah. 
So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him. This was after Islam. Didn't you feel in your heart a little bit of mercy? Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. And obviously the heart positively felt a lot of mercy, but because of the people. Sometimes we are embarrassed when our own children make a little bit of a noise and we want to clap them up in public just because we want to show the others that you know what? I'm trying to look after my child. That's not the time to admonish your child. Take them home quietly, just like how none of us would like to be told in public. So your children also don't like to be told in front of the guests at home. And it is wrong for you to admonish them in full view of the public. It reduces their confidence levels. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He guide us to be true guides to our own children, although we ourselves need guidance. So this was the condition of the people. They used to divorce as they wished and take back as many times. So Allah later on revealed a verse. الطلاق مرتان فإمساك بمعروف أو تسريح بإحسان. You can only divorce twice. You take back once if you want. Second time you can take back. The minute the third talaq drops or is given, you cannot take back until. And we read these verses this evening coincidentally in the surah that we read. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, until she marries again. I need to pause there for a moment. Why is it the case? Most of us don't even know how to divorce in Islam. And people think you just dish out three talaqs and walk away. Never ever do that. That is worse than a hooligan, worse than an animal. It is very sinful to dish out one, two, three. Very sinful. If you would want, you need to be calm. You need to relax. People say, I gave my talaq in anger. Well, what do you expect? Do you think people would now be sitting with coffee and say, my wife, I divorce you. Would that happen? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never make us people who are foolish. When angry, watch your tongue. Control yourself. Calm down. If you really cannot get along, one talaq, more than enough. You don't need to issue the second. You don't. Not at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Then if you want to get back, you can get back. No need to marry someone else and so on. Why is it that the third time she cannot get back to you? Because three whole times you tried so hard and she couldn't appreciate you or you could not appreciate her. She will never be able to live with you unless she has gone to someone else and has had an opportunity to compare you with someone else to the degree that she could not get along with him and was divorced from him. And now she says, let me go back to that man. He was much better. There were only 10 things wrong with him. This guy, there's 100 things wrong with him. Now it's, there's a chance of it working. So this is the logic behind it. Whereas we think, no, well, you know what? There was a man in Britain who told me once that, you know, I used to do halalas. You know what's a halala? For your information, it's haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed the one whom a halala is done for and the one who does it. Where people divorce one, two, three, and they have divorced their wives, they want to get back. So they tell their friend, you know what? Let's work around this. You marry her for one night, tomorrow morning you divorce her again. When she's finished her idda, she'll get back to me. So the man says, Astaghfirullah. He says, I used to do this. And he says, until one day, oh, there was such a princess who came in my direction, I refused to divorce her. He says, now she's my wife, I've got so many children with her. Subhanallah. Allah protect us. Yet, that is jahiliya. Allah curses those who do that. Why do we not control our tongues? For what? Why do we have to be so foolish and then run to the ulama for help when we have shot ourselves three times in the chest with our own gun, the bullet piercing straight through the heart, and we still want to resuscitate? The ignorance that was the time of Jahiliyyah before Islam. They divorced as they wished, took back. So the woman was always hanging. She didn't know whether she was coming or going. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now if you take a look at some of the good qualities that they had had. They were very intelligent and their memories were very, very powerful. They could tell you the lineage of the camels they had had. That this camel is the child of this one, this one, this one, seven generations back. Today, we don't even know our own forefathers seven generations back. How many of us, it's a challenge, can mention your father, grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather going back seven? Some are saying, yes, you probably are not from this country originally. Because with us who are born here, 
we have become very lazy with lineage. We barely know the names of our great grandfathers, let alone greater than that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the memory of those people who knew the lineage of even their animals, subhanallah. That's how powerful they were. And remember one thing, to fulfill, this is a very important point, to fulfill your duties to your relatives is not possible unless you know who your relatives are. Many of us don't even know how we are related, subhanallah. And yet we are related. Then if we take a look, they were people who were very honoring of the guests in most cases. They used to honor their guest. You find a person like Hatim al tai and so many others, Abdullah ibn Jad'an. He was a very, very uh, uh, generous person. Anyone came with any, you know, uh, story of how they were in debt and so on, he would sort it out for them. He was a poor man and one day he found a lot of wealth and he kept it and he went to one of the elders and said, I found a lot of wealth, what should I do? He says, well, you rather help people because that will result in you being remembered after you die. So he started helping everyone with wealth. He was known as very honoring. You see people of that time, when a guest came, they said, yes, yes, come home, you have a meal. And what they would do, they would slaughter their animals. How can you ask me about food in my home when this camel of mine that I'm riding with is right in front of you? Let's cut it out right now and we can enjoy a meal. Allahu Akbar. Whereas nowadays, you try to call a man, he doesn't even answer your call. Why? Perhaps he owes you money. Allahu Akbar. It happens. That's when the calls are not answered. And then what happens? People coming home, Alhamdulillah. It happens sometimes because of the different situations that people are in. And people say, okay, you know what? I'll let you know tomorrow. That means it's not coming. Don't worry. Let you know tomorrow means it's not coming. So those people had good habits, which we need to learn from. They were honoring of their guests, very generous people also. They also had generosity in them. Then they were very, very courageous. That was something else. They would go out with all valor. They would fight in the cause of protecting their own people and their tribes. They had lots of courage. If their fathers or relatives died in battle, they were very, very proud of the fact that this person died whilst protecting this tribe of ours or the clan or the city and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us some form of courage. Some of us do not even have courage to kill a fly, let alone to protect ourselves or our family members. Someone walks over your wife or your children and swears them in front of you and you can't even say, look, please, can you understand? Do not do this. Sometimes we just silent. We watch oppression. And we enjoy watching it to the degree that we are silent and we prod it. You see, if you don't stop oppression the first time it happens, it will repeat itself. The hadith the Prophet says, you must make sure that you stop the oppressor. If you don't, you will begin to make dua, 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 and Allah will not respond to that dua because you did not help yourself by stopping the oppressing people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from oppression and may He make us stop those who are oppressing others. So another thing that they loved was to fulfill a promise. When they made a promise, they would fulfill it in most cases. There were a few examples of when they did not do that, but the whole community would team up against them. Also, they were happy with very little. They lived in the heat. They were happy with small amounts of food and drink. And they were people who were always excited and they were always happy people, but they worshiped idols. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how these people were also quite strong. They had strong bodies and they were very muscular and they used to compete with one another. They used to fight as well and they used to protect one another at the same time. When I say fighting, the fighting was more with other clans. Within themselves, they tried their best not to allow disunity to overtake him. And then it's important for us to make mention of two very, very important incidents that occurred just before the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of them was the story of Zamzam. Very interesting story. The grandfather of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his name was Abdul Muttalib. This Abdul Muttalib was one of the leaders of Quraysh, Sayyidul Qawm. He was the top of Quraysh. And he used to have, he was a powerful, beautiful, meaning handsome man, very strong. And people looked at him, listened to him. He was extremely eloquent as well. And his place was right in the shade of the Kaaba. And he had a special mat which they laid for him. 
and he would sit on there. Nobody would ever dare sit on that mat. He would sit on it and he would dish out instructions and so on. And he had 11 children, subhanallah, 11 sons. And from amongst his sons was also Abdullah, the father of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had various others. And what happened is one day he says that I was sleeping in Al-Hijr. Al-Hijr is the part of the Kaaba. Nowadays you find a little crescent sort of uh, structure. It used to be within the Kaaba at a certain stage. And when they did not have halal funds to actually build it in that shape, they left it more or less like a cube. And that part, although it was in the Kaaba, is now out of it. So if you are reading Salah in it, it's as though you are reading Salah in the Kaaba. So this man was resting there and he saw a dream. In his dream, he was told to dig Taiba. So he asked, what is Taiba? Anyway, the dream came to an end. The next day, he was in the same place. He had a dream and he was told to dig Barra. He asked, what is Barra? And the dream came to an end. And the third day, he saw a dream. And the historians all make mention of this. And he was told to dig Madmuna, Madmuna. And he asked, what is that? And the dream came to an end. The fourth day, he saw a dream and he was told to dig Zamzam. So he asked, what is it? He was told it is a well that will never deplete. Everyone can drink from it. it. Water will gush from it forever and ever. It was there. He was basically informed exactly where its spot was. And he was told its history. And he was told where it was. So he got up in the morning. He got one of his children, Al Harith, according to one of the narrations. And the two of them began to dig. And Quraysh was watching. Quraysh, obviously, they all related to one another somehow. They have different clans depending on the children. And the children, like we have so many brothers, each brother, a different clan starts from one. So they watched him. When he started saying Allahu Akbar, imagine these were people of ignorance, but they still used terminologies referring to Allah. Because as I said, when they had issues, they referred it to Allah again. But they used to worship others besides Allah. Like sometimes what happens in our midst. We worship Allah alone. But then sometimes we happen to worship this and that and sticks and stones and graves and so on. And all this is against the law of Allah. The whole reason why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent was to remove mankind from worshipping man to worshipping the creator of man. Subhanallah. So let's not lose focus on this. So when he said Allahu Akbar, Quraysh came around. The people came around. They saw, yes, there is water here. They started debating, hey, this water belongs to our forefather. Who's your forefather? Ismail. Alayhi salatu was salam. And this water came from that time. Yes. And this water belongs to all of us, not to you. He said, no. It was in my dream. I was instructed. Had I not been instructed, you would have not known about it. So they decided, okay, let's go to someone who can be a judge between us. We don't want to fight amongst us. And they decided we will go to someone from Bani Sa'ad, a little bit further up north, close to the, where Sham is. Very, very far from the Arabian Peninsula. So a group of them got together, the leaders, and they left. They had a little bit of food with them and they got to a point where the desert stretched and stretched. They ran out of food and ran out of water. And now all of them were preparing for death. Abdul Muttalib and all his cl clansmen and the others who were debating going to this one fortune teller. So what had happened is they decided, okay, it's all over. The game is over. We cannot go back, nor can we go further. Every one of us is going to die. The best and most noble thing to do, let's all start digging our graves whilst we have a little bit of energy. The one who dies first will be buried by those who are to die later. So in that way, only one will be left out. But even he, he can go down and really, uh, you know, get ready to sleep. Allahu Akbar. So this was their plan. They started digging. And as they started digging and preparing for death, what happened? Abdul Muttalib walked towards his animal, his camel. And suddenly from its feet, water started gushing miraculously from the feet of this animal, which belonged to Abdul Muttalib at a distance from where everyone was. And immediately they were all shocked. This was before Islam. And they immediately said, this is a sign that your well is the well of Zamzam, meaning you will be the leader, you will be in charge of that water. It's not like he was going to have it for himself. Everyone was going to be obviously quenched from the water of Zamzam. But at the same time, who was going to be the leader? That was what was being discussed. So they immediately acknowledged, they drank from the water and they said, now let's go back. No point to go further. They went back and Abdul Muttalib was the one responsible for that water. He used to feed, he used to give the Hajis water. Those who used to come for that 
pagan hajj as we made mention of. And everyone drank from that water to this day. The water is gushing out of that spot in Makkah al-Mukarramah. All of us know that. And I think in all our homes, we have some of that water known as Zamzam. The Prophet wasallam later says, Zamzam lima shuriba lah. The water of Zamzam is for whatever intention it is drunk for. You want to drink it to be cured, you will be cured. You want to drink it to pass your exams, you will pass your exams. You want to drink it for sustenance, you will have sustenance. You want to drink it for any other reason, you will have that inshallah. For as long as it's a noble reason and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a drink from Zamzam and may He make us from those who can constantly have it in our homes for indeed it even protects from the devil. So this was the story that was worth mentioning and it was a sign because Abdul Muttalib for your information was already informed by certain people. One was the king of Yemen, one was one of the Jewish people he had known and some of the fortune tellers told him that from your lineage something big is going to happen. One of your grandchildren is going to be a super leader. One of your grandchildren is going to come and change everything happening here and he was told this constantly by various people. And this was another sign that he was a chosen man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to be the grandfather. Not only the grandfather, he looked after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam later on as we will see. So the next story that is very, very important and worth mentioning is the story of an Abyssinian man who became the king of Yemen and his name was Abraha. And this Abraha, he was the king of Yemen. And he was a Christian man who had built a church in Yemen. And he wanted people to flock there for many reasons to worship there as well as for business purposes. And he was told that no, we have in Mecca, there is this house that everyone goes to and you need to deal with them if you want people to come here. That was something that he spoke about or he was told. So he said, no problem. I have one elephant, a big elephant. We will take the elephant and we will walk through with our armies and we will continue. Now, obviously there is a narration that says the vast of narrations say there, were, there was just one main big elephant. The rest were normal camels and so on. And they, there are some historians who say, no, it was a whole army of many elephants. But the Quran speaks of one elephant, Al-Fil, meaning one elephant. So the people of the elephant, a big, huge elephant, and there were armies that came with and they started marching towards Makkah al Mukarrama. When they were outside somewhere near Ta'if, they sent a messenger to say, go and look for the Sayyid, the leader of these people and tell them, we don't want to fight. We are coming, destroy the house and we're going back. So Abdul Muttalib was the leader. He was told, this is what the man is coming for. He said, okay, let him come. Now imagine I told you moments ago, these were courageous people. And these people would fight to protect their dignity and so on. This man said, okay, let them come. And in the process, the army came in and usurped more than 200 camel of Quraysh. And Abdul Muttalib told one of these men, look, you can come and destroy the house. No problem. But our camels, we want them back. So the man took him to Abraha and Abdul Muttalib spoke to Abraha and told him, I would like my 200 camels. So Abraha says, when I saw you, big, huge, handsome man, very eloquent. I was very happy. I thought this man here is a very honored leader here. But now that you're asking a favor, you have expressed your foolishness. We are coming to destroy your honor here. We are coming to destroy the house. And you want to ask for your camels, which is minor. It's a small item. So he says, the camels belong to us. We need them back. As for the house, it has a Lord who will protect it. That's it. Subhanallah. And he walked away. He was given the camels and these people started proceeding towards the Kaaba. The, the elephant refused to go further. It stopped. Amazing. It stopped. And they began to beat it. It refused. It didn't go further. When they turned it around and beat it, it went running. When they stopped it and turned it back around, it stopped again. Subhanallah. Who stopped it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as they progressed, the armies began to move towards the Kaaba. No sooner did they come closer to it than they noticed birds from nowhere in the skies. And these birds had three little pebbles each. 
the size of a pea and even smaller, small little pebbles made of clay. And from a very high altitude, they released these pebbles. And the pebbles came down at such force. You know, today we have, we learn about gravity and we learn about Newton and this one and that one. Wallahi, if you take a look at this explanation of Surat Al-Fil, you will come to realize that that altitude, when it dropped from there, the small pebbles went straight through these men and killed them on the spot. And people were just watching. Allahu Akbar. Didn't Abdul Muttalib say that house has a Lord who will protect it? To this day, you need to remember the Kaaba is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent those birds protect the Kaaba for us and the Haramain for us. And may He make us from those who can continue going there in a manner that we are safe and secure. And may we never see days when we are prohibited from going there for whatever reason. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this and mention is made of this in Surah Al-Fil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fil. Did you not see what your Rabb has done to the people of the elephant? Those who came with the elephant, Allah destroyed them. And some of them whom these pebbles did not get to, they were injured, they went back. And they were inflicted with disease so much so that Abraha himself, his organs began to drop. Literally, his fingers started falling off. And everywhere they went, as they went back, they were heading back. And his hand fell off. Next thing, his leg fell off. And then he died. A very bad death. So these were two incidents that had happened just before the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then came the blessed birth, after which the whole world changed it changed in a way that up to this day that change is felt and up to the end of time there will be people who will be guided by the word of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so if you look at us when we look at muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life as i said we understand revelation he is the one who brought revelation we need to know who he was and his words are known as hadith we need to know who he was his name was Muhammad ibn Abdullah, ibn Abdul Muttalib, ibn Hashim, ibn Abdi Manaf. So he was from the clan of Banu Hashim, who fell under Quraysh. So his father's name was Abdullah, his grandfather was Abdul Muttalib. Where was he born? He was born in Mecca. Today, if you travel to Mecca, to Al-Mukarramah, you will notice where Safa and Marwa is. If you were to come out on that side, you notice a large open space where people read Salah. Very soon it's going to be taken into the haram. Then you will notice a building standing on its own, known as a library. It is reported that just there was the birthplace of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was the house of Abu Talib because his father had passed away when he was seven months in his mother's womb. And the father was 25 years old, very young. If you take a careful look at what the historians say, they say Allah took this man away after his seed was planted into the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His job in this dunya was over. His job in the world was over. And he passed away 25 years old whilst Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seven months in the womb of his mother. And his mother Amina binti Wahab ibn Abd Manaf, who was also from the similar clan of Quraysh, she says, it was the easiest, the easiest gestation period. The pregnancy was simple. I didn't feel anything. The childbirth was absolutely easy, as though I didn't even give birth. Subhanallah. The most blessed of all creatures was just being born. We want to go into the moment of birth, inshallah, in a few moments. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the death of the father of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina Munawwara. Did you know that? He passed away in al Madinah Al-Munawwara. He was gone to Sham and he came back to meet some of his relatives in Medina. And on his way back, he passed away in al Madinah Al-Munawwara. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went back there at a later stage in his life. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was born, unlike all the other children, the narrations make mention that when he was born, he came down with his hands, his hands down and his 
face was looking up to the skies. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Pure, already circumcised, and his umbilical cord was already separated. Subhanallah. This is made mention by most of the narrations. Some of them say that the circumcision was already done. And some say Abdul Muttalib did it seven days later and he had fed a few people in happiness of a grandchild being born. And he had already known in his heart and mind, this child is going to be someone great because so many people had already told him. But they, would, they did not know he's going to be a Nabi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they knew he's going to come and something great is going to happen. Amina binti Wahab, the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that when I was expecting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about to deliver, I saw a light come out of my belly from which the palaces of Sham were lit. And I knew that something is happening. And on that day, it is reported that the fire that was worshipped by the Persians in Iran was extinguished and they had to rekindle it. Allahu Akbar. And it is reported that some of the idols that were placed on the Kaaba had dropped down on that day. And it is reported that Kisra, the Kisra that was there, his, the, the balcony, part of the structure that made his palace had dropped on that day. And they had to rebuild it. Subhanallah. And this was all signs. These were signs later on, which were only to be interpreted that this man's message was to get across the globe. You know, when someone dies, what happens? After they die, we say, but just yesterday he said, I might not see you again. Happens to us. It's a sixth sense. He did not know he was going to die, but Allah makes him say statements that is a lesson for those who are to come later on. And we busy engrossed in, did he know or didn't he know? The more important thing, whether he knew or not, is nothing for us. But what is more important is what are you doing now before you get to that condition? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a good death. So the same applies here. Things happened and later on they were to come to reality. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we said, umbilical cord separated, already circumcised, subhanallah. He came down looking up to the heavens. And one narration actually makes mention that he was born with his finger up, the, one, the first finger, the finger of shahada. And this was to depict the fact that Allah is one alone. Don't worship anyone else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq and the acceptance to worship him and him alone. And then subhanallah, his mother says, the grandfather Abdul Muttalib loved him so much. He was sitting where the Kaaba was and I covered him with a utensil and sent for Abdul Muttalib to be called so that he would be the first one to see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he came, by the time we looked back at him, that utensil was already broken into two and he was there subhanallah and the grandfather was so happy so happy because the father had already passed away and he made him a man he made him a young boy who was very close to him and inshallah tomorrow we will look at the other miracles of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was born what had happened how he grew up and where he was sent and what happened thereafter inshallah we will look at that before i end i need to make mention of one point there are many people of today who have fabricated certain miracles. They say this happened and that happened. I want to mention two or three of them so that we know there is no need for us to fabricate anything because what is correct is already there and the miracles have already happened. So why should we then fabricate? It only drops the value of the story. I heard one of the scholars say, one of the people say that, you know, at the time Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born, the minaras of the haram made sajda. But brother, there were no minaras at the time. You need to know that. And then they said, I've heard them say also that the golden stand where Maqam Ibrahim is got up and made sajda. Brother, there was no golden stand at the time. So let's not fool each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the mahabba, the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of creation. Imagine the moment when he came onto the earth, so many things across the globe had happened, which are absolutely authentic, which he makes mention of later on. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us appreciative of the fact 
that we are part of the ummah who have accepted all the prophets jesus may peace be upon him moses may peace be upon him muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all of them we respect them and we say may peace be upon them all and may peace be upon us until we meet again wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallahi wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk